One of the moves that Bible translators have made in the last few years is the move to a more gender neutral or gender inclusive translation philosophy. Anytime that we make adjustments to the Bible and translating the Bible, we always want to make sure that the adjustments are making the Bible more accurate, not less accurate. The issue with that is, what is more accurate? Is more literal more accurate? Or is something a little bit more dynamic more accurate? So let me give you an example. If Paul says, brothers, I urge you to do such and such, well, he's not just talking to the men. If accurate is literal, it's brothers. If accurate is who Paul's addressing, it's brothers and sisters. The, to, be, to be more accurate in like Paul's actual intent of his communication is inclusive. He's talking to the whole church, but he refers to the whole church in the masculine generic, just like English used to do, more so like in the 80s and 90s and hundreds of years prior. And when, you, when the gender of a group was unknown, you referred to that group as he. So that's changed over time, and as language changes, the translations change. Now, my view on this has changed over the last several years. When I first heard about this, probably 2002, 2003, the TNIV was about to come out. We got some pre-ordered copies in seminary, and at first I thought, oh, this is going to be a political move. I'm not so sure about it. Um, I'm pretty traditionally minded, so, you know, probably not a good idea, probably not a good move. And then, you know, the more I looked at it, I thought, well... You know, if women are not finding themselves in the text because it just says brothers and it's, they're having hard, if anyone's having a hard time understanding that that instructions for them, then let's have inclusive language in those instances. If that's helpful, and if Paul meant the entire audience of the church, then why not? Why not go with a more inclusive language? That's that's a good thing. Now, as I've looked at it more in depth over the last few years, I've noticed some issues that I want to bring up in this video. I think it's important to be informed, and I think it's important to at least understand the issues that are involved so that you can make your own decision. The very first translation to do this was the New Revised Standard Version, 1989. Now, they did not set out to be a gender-inclusive or more gender-neutral translation. And when we say gender-neutral, we don't actually mean that all genders are removed from the Bible. We're just saying that in instances where it's generic, you become more neutral or more inclusive. After that was the TNIV that came out in 05, the 2011 NIV, obviously 2011, New American Standard and New Living Translation. Those are the main translations that have adopted a more gender-inclusive approach. One of the big things I want to say on the front end is this. Uh, I'm not trying to cast doubt on Bible translation. I'm not trying to get you to say, oh, Bible translators are doing a horrible job. I do think we have to be open-minded and aware of the shortfalls whenever we change the approach. So what kind of adjustments exactly are we talking about here? Let's look at some. Let's start with the good. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers. Well, is he appealing just to the brothers? No, he's appealing to the entire church. So they changed that to, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters. In the 2011 NIV, I believe that's also the case in the NRSV. But then you have 1 Corinthians 14, 26. What, sh uh, what should be done then, my brothers? They changed that to, what should be done then, my friends? Which removes the familial language of Paul's whole adoption theology. I mean, it, it really... Not the biggest deal in the world, but the language of Paul to talk about Christians and or disciples is family language. So whenever you change that to friends, it just kind of loses the whole, the whole feel. In 1 Corinthians 6.6, 6, brothers is changed into believers. If a brother goes to court against another, that's turned into if a believer goes into court against another believer. Okay, So it, it, what is a believer? Is that a Christian? Is that a disciple? Is that a brother and a sister? Is that just someone who just believes in God? All of a sudden, you know, you got to really wonder what that's all about. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, when it comes to the flood, it's good. They said the word Adam is changed from I'm going to blot out mankind from the world to I'm going to blot out humanity from all the world. It's everyone. God didn't just send the flood to kill the men. Old translations would sound like they just God sent the flood to kill the men. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 15, we get this. Whoever strikes his father shall be put to death. Well, that's changed to father and mother because the same penalty applied to if it was your mother. Is that more literal? No. But is that what the text is saying? Yes, absolutely. In Matthew 12, 12, it says, how much more valuable are people than sheep? That's the word anthropos, people. Sometimes people think the word anthropos means men. Well, it can mean men, but often and actually more often, the word anthropos is humanity. It's all of mankind is people. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, Jesus says to be careful to not practice your piety not just before men, but before others. That's more accurate. That's a good move, right? Because you could say, well, if I'm being very, very literal here, like a legalist looking for a loophole, I would say, well, I guess I can practice my piety before women because Jesus only condemns practicing piety before men. So others works that out. Is it literal? No. Is it accurate? Yes. Okay, so there's some good things that are going on with this. Brothers to brothers and sisters. Uh, murdering your parent is not just your, your father, but your father and your mother things like that. Those are, those are good moves, but they're not all good moves. Okay. 
So I, I want to mention a few that I just find problematic. In Ezekiel 2 verse 1, God is addressing Ezekiel and he tells him, Stand up, O son of man. The NIV 2011 has kept that. The NRSV changed that to stand up, O mortal. Okay. Why do that? Like, I really don't understand why that would be the case. Is What is the passage really emphasizing? Well, it's emphasizing his mortality. It's saying you are not a god, right? Like, you're just a mortal man. You're just a mortal human being. Well, Ezekiel happens to be a man, so it's accurate to call him a son. What this also does, though, is like if you were doing a study on Son of Man and like where that language comes from in reference to Jesus, and you were studying the NRSV and you were doing a word search, you would never find Ezekiel 2.1. So they're, they're moving from a more literal translation to a more dynamic translation. And in doing so, if you're studying this, you're going to completely miss this passage. You're going to have no idea that this passage exists, that, that God called Ezekiel the son of man. And then there's a verse like Matthew 7, 3. He says, if you see a speck of dust in your brother's eye, changes into, if you see a speck of dust in your neighbor's eye, in your neighbor's eye. If I'm doing a word search on the word neighbor, and I'm looking at like, who is my neighbor, good Samaritan, I'm finding Matthew 7, 3. Well, what are we supposed to do toward our neighbor? What does the Bible say about how to treat our, our neighbor? All of a sudden, you just introduce things into the text that are just not helpful uh, in order to iron out some things. In the book of Proverbs, we have a father giving his son advice. Some of these translations have changed the son to child, but have not changed the father to parents, which I find really interesting. Because you could have a mother giving advice, like if you want to be relatable, you could have a mother giving advice, right? But they, they keep it father, but then they change it to child, right? So maybe that, like women can hear themselves in this receiving the advice of the father in Proverbs. Now, the NIV did not make that change in 2011. They kept the son the son. One that really baffles me is Acts 10, 26, where Peter's with Cornelius. Cornelius bows down before Peter, and Peter says, stand up, I'm only a man. That's accurate. Peter is only a man. He, what he's saying is, in a sense, is he's saying, I'm not God. You don't need to worship me like that. You don't need to bow down before me. You only bow down before God. The, uh, some of these translations have changed that into, you know, stand up. I'm only a mortal. I'm only a mortal. Okay. That's kind of what Peter's really getting at. I'm not a God. Uh, but I really, I don't, under, I don't really understand why the need to make that less literal, honestly. Uh, this is not a generic situation. This is not an instruction that is uh, written to a generic group of people, men and women in a mixed group. This is Peter, who is a man. Stand up, I'm only a man. Like, that's absolutely true. Just leave that alone. I, I really don't understand that. The one that's a little bit more troubling is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, and then down in verse 12, and then in chapter 5, where you have this phrase that an elder is to be the husband of but one wife. That's the old NIV. The new NIV has changed this to faithful to his wife, which is good. I mean, that's fine. He's only had one wife. He's faithful to his wife. But the NRSV changed this to married only once. Married only once. Why would they make a change to married only once? Well, that's an egalitarian move is what that is to say, well, it's not talking about that it must be a husband and that that husband would have only one wife, but that it's just someone, someone generic, who is married only once. The literal phrase there is basically the word one, the word woman, and the word man. That's the same with elders in chapter 3, verse 2. That's the same with deacons in chapter 3, verse 12. And it's also the same in chapter 5 when he talks about widows making the list that they should have only been the wife of one husband. It's the exact same phrase only applied to, to women, only applied to widows in that case. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1 is another one that just kind of befuddles me. Every high priest is chosen from among mortals. Chosen from among mortals. Well, that's true, but that's not what it says. It says every high priest is chosen from among men. Was there ever a woman high priest? Was the pool for the high priesthood ever including of women? No, it never was, ever. Like, it's accurate and fair and right to say that they were chosen from among men because that's exactly how they chose the high priest. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 also made an interesting change where it says, for since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead also came through a human being. Well, guess what? Both of those were men. Adam was a man. Jesus was a man. Accurate and fair to say, death came through a man. Resurrection came through a man. Okay? For as in Adam all die, so it would be made alive in Christ. They're both men. Why change that? I really don't, I don't understand that. In the Old Testament, the men of war changed into warriors. Okay? Warriors could be men or women, but that's not who the army was. The army would generally were men. But they're trying to really, the effort here is to remove patriarchal language, right? The he's and the him's and the father's and the son's and the brother's. And what they end up doing in many cases it ends up with some weird results. Like Job chapter 24, verse 9. This is kind of subtle, but just listen to what this says. They removed fatherless. They removed the word fatherless. 
Because there, there's a difference between being an orphan and being fatherless, right? An orphan is someone who's lost both parents. Someone who's fatherless can still have their mother. So here's what they ended up with in the NRSV. There are those who snatch the orphan child from the breast and take as a pledge the infant of the poor. They're not an orphan if they're at the breast. It's, they're, they're, they're taking fatherless out of this passage, right? It's talking about the fatherless child. Well, the fatherless child still has a mother, but it, they're in a poor position because they have no father to provide for them. That's important. It's very important. In an effort to smooth out that language, there's no need to smooth out that language. It's an actual situation where someone's fatherless, but is still at their mother's breast. Like, why, why iron that out? It makes no sense. And there's a really big one in Psalm 119, verses 11 and 12. Now, just, just listen to this. It says, Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. He's talking about the scriptures. Okay? But who can detect their errors? Okay, very subtle. Here's what it said previous. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward, but who can discern his errors? They changed his to their in an effort to remove the generality of verse 12. Now it sounds like that the Bible has errors. It says, by keeping the word of God, your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? The errors of the scriptures? No, their own errors. So that's really a problem. So this happens an awful lot. Um, whenever they're trying to iron out these things with he and him, they move to there. And what they're doing, they're moving to a, from a singular to a plural. And that can really mess some things up. Wayne Grudem figured out exactly how many times that the NRSV had the word they or their more than the RSV. It was like 1,700 times. So like 1,700 times they changed a singular pronoun to a plural pronoun. And that really can have an effect on what you read in the text. There was this little game that we played when we were kids. It was in a little plastic case and you could slide the things around. They might have like the numbers one through eight on them. There'd be eight little pieces of plastic in there and one missing piece. There might be a picture of a clown's face or something creepy like that in the 80s. We didn't really care about creeping people out. And you would move a piece like, so say that, say the numbers were all out of order and you're trying to get the one first and go like one to eight. So you would have to move a piece into the empty space and move another piece over and move a piece and move another piece. And eventually, you, if you did it just right, you could get the whole puzzle in order. But what you found is kind of like a game of chess. you got to move a piece to get another piece in the right place. And it seems to me in some of these instances, they're trying to remove patriarchy, right? They're trying to remove this gender-specific uh, language so that people can read the Bible and find themselves in the pages of Scripture, especially when instructions are to a generic group of people. Okay, and that's fine to a degree, but there are instances when in trying to move that piece and trying to move that piece, they had to move other pieces that then really messed up the whole picture. And now you don't even know what you're looking at, right? Now you're trying to look something up and you're not even finding what's there. So if you want something a little bit more literal that's made some of those changes, probably the best balance within this, I'm more, more and more convinced it's probably the New American Standard Bible. Now, I want to just conclude by saying this is a very, very small percentage of the Bible text that is actually being affected in a way that has any serious implications or repercussions. In fact, there's probably no actual serious, serious, serious doctrinal implications or repercussions from these sorts of changes, but they do affect the way we study the Bible, read the Bible, and uh, when we go to the Bible in English and try to study it or do word studies, this completely can throw us off our game, and I'm, I'm not really a big fan of that. I would rather them give us what's there and then let us make our own interpretations you know, rather than them do all the work for us, maybe make some footnotes in some places, you know, but it's hard to make, you know, 7,000 footnotes. So all that to say, be aware of what is going on out there. And I'm certain that there's some political implications and ramifications for this, just as there was in the past 1611 King James, the word baptism was not translated for political reasons. These things happen. The move against patriarchy, you know, moves toward more feministic approaches are just going to become more and more common. And we, but we, what we really, really, really want deep down inside of our bones is an accurate Bible translation. Like, if you just give me an accurate Bible translation, again, the question goes back to what is accurate? Is accurate literal or is accurate something else? And those are the kind of things that we have to be like wrestle with and become aware of. Uh, just trying to inform you. You make your own decision. Make your own call. Talk with me in the comments about it. And if you don't mind, I would love for you to give this a thumbs up. Let YouTube know, hey, this is working. And uh, appreciate all of you. If you haven't subscribed, now's the time. Love you. And we will talk again soon. Take care.